Well, welcome to the bridge. We're glad you guys are here. Would you please stand with us? We're going to clap our hands. We're going to worship God in this place. Come on. Hey. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. Come on. This bad bone. Yeah. And I tried with all my might. But I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. A vagabond. Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, come on, because he healed my heart, he changed my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Come on, if that's your story, let's clap our hands together. There's reason to celebrate. Come on. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. Yeah. So, so long to my old friends, burning in bitterness, you can just keep it moving, oh, you ain't welcomed here, from now on, come on, from now on, I'll walk the streets of gold, I'll sing with how you saved my soul, this way we're done. coming in. We're glad that you're here. Can I just say, God loves you. If you didn't know that when you walked in, all throughout the Bible, God tells us to run to him, to give us, to give him our worries and our burdens. Let's continue to do that. And I've carried a burden to I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go, and I 
We're actually going to continue our worship as we go into a time of communion. And as you are walking in here, I'm pretty sure you grab one of these cups with the elements. And I do want to say, maybe it's your first time here at the bridge and you're still new to this whole Christianity thing. I would actually encourage you not to partake, but just to watch and see what we do. But if you are a Christian, this is a time for us to express gratitude to God for who he is and what he's done. 2,000 years ago, God, he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life, which he did. And then Jesus, he was falsely accused. He was imprisoned. He was beaten. He was whipped. And then he was crucified on a cross. And it was for my sin and it was for your sin. And more than that, it was because God, he wanted to restore the relationship between us. 
so that we can have eternity, so that we can have eternal life. And so even as you look at that cup and you look at those elements, that bread represents Jesus' body that was broken for you. And that juice, it represents his blood that was spilt for you. And so before we take the elements, maybe even right now you walked in here today with a heavy heart. Maybe there's some things that you need to confess. Maybe there's some things that are really holding you back from truly worshiping God. And so he says, come before me right now, admit those things and you're gonna be forgiven. And, it's like, and that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna take some time as we come before God. Jesus on the night before he was betrayed, he had dinner with his disciples. And as they were sitting around this dinner table, he broke some bread and he said, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then a little while later as well, Jesus, he would pour some wine and he would say, this is the new covenant of my blood spilt for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. And thank you for your forgiveness that we have through you. God, you're such a good God. We love you, we thank you, and we pray this all in the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing together? Our God is worthy and he is good. And the song reminds us of why he is.
the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me that's good do that again it came the morning that sealed the promise continue this worship right now as we go into a time of prayer and what we want to pray for is Des Plaines Evangelical Free Church here in Des Plaines. They're a great gospel teaching church who are on the same mission as us to reach people in the community with Jesus and with his message. Pastor Steve Nelly, he's the lead pastor there and so we want to pray for him and we want to pray for his church and so on the screen behind me right now there's a few ways that we can be praying for the Des Plaines Evangelical Free Church, but this time it's between you and God, and then I'll close us here in a few moments. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you hear every single one of our requests. And we pray for Pastor Steve, for his church, that you would continue using them in big ways for your glory, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to The Bridge. My name is Denham, and I'm the campus pastor here. And if this is your first time, thank you so much for joining us. Our mission here at The Bridge is to connect you to God, to people, and to service. And we really hope that that happens for you today. We would love to connect with you right now. And so if you will pull out your phone and scan that QR code that's on the screen behind me, this will take you to our Connect card. And please fill this Connect card out with as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. If you're a first-time guest, that could just be your first name and any other information you feel comfortable sharing. And then if you're a returning guest, that could just be your name and any other information that might have changed. You can also give right through this QR code, but I want you to know that if this is your first time here, please don't feel obligated to give. This is really for those who call the bridge home. We'll have some offering buckets on the way out, and here's a couple more things coming up at the bridge. Hi, I'm Issa, and here's what's happening at the bridge. Are you new to the bridge? If you answered yes, then Bridge 101 is for you. 
This two-week class is your next step to find out more about who we are and where we're going as a church. Our next class meets on June 23rd and 30th. Sign up on our website. Our annual celebration is two weeks away, Sunday, May 19th at 4 p.m. This is a big deal. It's one of our favorite services of the year and it's for everyone who calls the bridge home, whether you're a member or regular attender. We will pack out our displays location to worship together and celebrate the last 12 months. Then we'll look ahead to our next ministry year. Mark your calendar and we'll see you there. Do you play bass, drums, guitar, keys, or sing? One of our favorite parts of the weekend is worshiping God together through music. We need talented people to be a part of our music teams at each location. So musicians, we need you to use your gifts. Visit thebridge.church slash serving to let us know you're interested. We can't wait to hear from you. That's it for today. Please grab your phone right now and put it on silent. If you need to take it out of your purse or pocket, go for it. It really helps us create an amazing atmosphere. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of the service. Several years ago, we had a construction project going on at our house, and, and the builder was, man, was he grumpy. I don't know. Maybe it was me, but, you know, any kind of a suggestion that I made or request, he was so pessimistic and negative, and I didn't even want to go to him about anything anymore, but I, I noticed he was so nice to Linda, and so I got this idea. Anytime I thought, we should probably do this or maybe request this change, I I would have her go to him, and he was so nice and agreeable. Oh, sure, that's no problem. Oh, we can do that. Sometimes it's better to have the lady ask for the hard things. And maybe that's what James and John were doing in Matthew 20, because their mom comes to Jesus and says, can my two sons sit next to you in your kingdom, one on each side? Well, I know people say that there are no such thing as stupid questions. I'm one that believes that there's a lot of stupid questions. And I've been asked them, and I've asked them myself. And I, I think Jesus thought that about this, because he doesn't even look at her. He doesn't respond to her at all. He just looks at James and John, knowing that they probably put her up to this. And he says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? They said, oh, yes, they replied. We are able. And then... Jesus says, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. It's these words, this memory, that would no doubt stick and later haunt these two brothers. In fact, days later, Jesus was whipped, crucified. He drank of that cup he was speaking of. And they know that this cup will also be brought to their lips. We're going to fast forward 10 years and find ourselves in Acts chapter 12. So let's grab those Bibles and take a look at this. We're going to project very little of what we're going to be looking at. So you're going to want to see this yourself here at the bridge. We just believe in the Bibles, and it's good for you to know your Bible as well. So grab that Bible and page 920. If you don't have a Bible of your own here, then we've got those blue hardcover Bibles, which work great. It's page 920. And if, by the way, if you don't have a Bible of your own, just take that home with you. You can have that blue hardcover Bible. We, we'll replace it. So page 920 if in those Bibles. Otherwise, of course, you can use your phones or whatever you have. Also, notes in the bulletin as well as on the app. Encourage you to take those notes. It's helpful for remembering. And let's pray. Father, we believe that this is your word. And we believe it is true. We pray that you would now engage our minds and work in our hearts. May this message change lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, James Zebedee, he wasn't just a disciple of John. He was part of the inner circle. He and his brother, John, were nicknamed by Jesus the Sons of Thunder. Some have speculated, well, does that mean Zebedee, their father? He was a man with a temper? Or was it these two boys? I, I think it was James and John because, I mean, they're the guys that also, when there was a whole city that wasn't listening to Jesus' words, and, and they said, you want us to call down fire from heaven upon these people? 
And I think that's about when Jesus said, I'm going to just call you the sons of thunder. The Orthodox tradition has it that after the church was launched, that James went traveling to Jewish communities in the Jewish diaspora or dispersion to tell about Jesus that, that he was the Messiah and to announce the gospel. And then he returned a few years later to this giant welcoming in Jerusalem that uh, all these admiring Christians so happy to have him back, happy to have this close disciple of Jesus back home. It was said to be in this context that our text begins. So look at verse 1. We read, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Now, Herod, it says Herod the king, and this was not the same king that had uh, attempted to put the baby Jesus to death, had killed all those babies in Bethlehem. That was Herod the Great. This is Herod Agrippa I. He's actually the grandson of Herod the Great. He's also not the same Herod that killed John the Baptist and that Jesus stood before in his trials that would have been about 10 years before this. That was Herod Antipas, and he was the uncle of this Herod, Herod Agrippa. And actually, what had happened is, about three years before this, he, had, he, <laughs> he was quite the politician. He had his own uncle deposed from being the king and fell in, in good terms with Caligula, the Roman emperor, and Caligula then appointed him in Antipas's place. And so, I mean, this guy, uh, he's now coming into Jerusalem. He's going to want to be able to keep the peace as best he can. And as he gets into the prized Jerusalem, he realizes, well, there is a bit of a problem, these Jesus followers, that they are ticking off the religious system, and they're trying to change things, and the religious rulers are not happy about it, and so there's a lot of debating and public arguing going on. And of course, in Rome, I mean, the Pax Romana was everything, and rulers rose and fell based on whether or not they were able to gain peace or keep peace. And so, you know, to be fair, I'm not defending Agrippa because he was a ruthless man and not a good person at all, but his plan makes political sense. If Herod can eliminate the ongoing Jesus problem, he'll gain favor with the temple leaders and the Romans. That's both peace and approval ratings, and that's a win-win for him. So Herod starts methodically going after the leaders. He wants to remove the head, scare the church by attacking church leaders. And James is the perfect target. He's one of the closest disciples of Jesus, very well known. He's a hero of these Jesus followers, and he's back in town now, so Christians are crowding around him, wanting to hear him. Strategically, this is the guy to go after, and he does. Verse 2, he killed James, that is he, Herod, killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. The words of Jesus, yet again, come true. It was just 10 years ago that James watched his rabbi Jesus drink that cup of suffering. His blood was spilt in these streets, and now James's blood was spilt in the same st- streets. And I, I wonder that as the sword was thrust through, if those words of Jesus, you will indeed drink from this bitter cup, if they didn't come to his mind. But because Jesus first drank from that cup, after the sword, the first face James saw was his beloved friend who spoke those words. Now, most of the disciples will be murdered. James is just the first. All right, well, let's look at verse 3. Verse 3 in the text. And when he, Herod, saw that it pleased the Jews. Now, it wasn't all the Jews. I mean, the church is mainly Jewish at this point, and there are thousands of them. We're probably, we're probably talking thirty to 40,000 by this time, and you start adding up all of the numbers. So it wasn't all of the Jews, but it was the Jewish leaders, and those are the ones that he wanted to be in with. They're the ones that are going to keep the peace. So because he saw that it pleased them, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread, which is a Passover. And when he had seized him, seized Peter, of course, Peter was the recognized leader of the Christians in Jerusalem. So when he had received, uh, had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Actually, four squads seems like a lot because uh, every squad had four soldiers. So you're talking about 16 soldiers. You're wondering, why, why so many to guard unarmed Peter, and even if Peter was armed, he's not much of a threat. Remember, in the garden, all he could do was cut the guy's ear off. But why so many? Well, actually, this would have been four soldiers every six hours because it was guarding him around the clock. So they would have been guarding him in shifts. There would have been two that were chained to each of his wrists or his arms, and then two at the door. So this was maximum security. Continue uh, in verse 4. It says, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. 
So after the Passover, and why after the Passover? Jesus was ex- executed during the Passover. But that was because it was an illegal trial. It was actually illegal for Jews to perform an execution during a high holiday. Now, Pilate didn't have to observe that because he was Roman and he didn't have to follow through on the Jewish laws. Herod, in some sense, considered himself to be Jewish and was trying to be in with the Jews. So he wasn't going to do it during a holiday. Jesus was executed during the Passover because he was the Passover lamb. There was huge symbolism in that. And so it was important that he was. But uh, Herod wasn't going to do it under the radar the way the Pharisees had, and the, Sa- the Sanhedrin had tri- Jesus. He wanted to do it in front of everybody. He, he wanted to do this publicly. So verse 5, it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made by the church. Now there's a, he's in prison. He's got these guards guarding him. But a spoiler alert here, Peter is going to escape out of prison. And it's a fun story. We'll get into it in just a second. But I want to pause just for a second because think about this. James is dead. And I just told you that Peter is going to wind up with this really cool story of escaping. And it doesn't seem fair. I mean, God loves James as much as Peter, right? I mean, James was just as faithful, if not more, James was just as dedicated. James was just as genuine. Why is James murdered? But Peter gets a cool story about his rescue. You ever, ever have those thoughts? I don't know, I have. We just heard Lynn Hassel's story, our staff did this last week, and we'll talk a little bit more about her and her husband, Bob, at the end of the message. But um, Lynn is one of our she's a full-time counselor here at the bridge, and she's got quite a background. But 25 years ago, She wound up going into a very, very deep depression. It started with a a pregnancy with a lot of illness. In fact, she was so bad. She she was just sick sick as a dog, could not eat anything. They had to feed her intravenously. She would manage, and and really it was important to go to church, so she would force herself to go to church, already slipping into a depression during this time, which just postpartum made things worse, and and then it just spiraled out of control to the place where later on she actually, it was an attempt on her own life. So it's major, I mean, this is a big deal. But the early stages of this, and part of her thinking that got her into trouble, she's sitting there in church, could not eat anything, just as sick as could be, white as a sheet, and there were a couple of teenage girls in front of her who had gotten pregnant out of wedlock, and they were fine. They were feeling great. And she was thinking there, I've done everything right, and, and here I'm this sick, and, and these girls are, are, are totally fine. I mean, God is good and gracious to them, but he's not good to me. And that was her thinking. Why me and not them? Or I thought of this when I, actually, when I was in transition between our church in Wisconsin and here 17 years ago, uh, earlier that year, a girl named Rachel, uh, it was a a wonderful girl, came from a really rough background. Her father was, had been incarcerated for murder. He was then, he had then became a fugitive. In fact, when she was little, she and her sister and her mom, we took them into our home to protect them because it was a real safety issue. And... um, she grew up with Erica. She and Erica were good friends. But in high school, she developed brain cancer. And from the very beginning, we knew that uh, there was no hope, that it was going to be fatal. I had moved here while she was still really sick. And we drove back a couple of times to go see her. In fact, we went back when she was in final hospice, just a couple of days away from passing. I remember walking out of that room after praying with her. I mean, I, my, my eyes are just wet with tears. And I couldn't help but think, why her? After all she's been through, why her? Why not me? And I pray through some of your prayer requests. Losing loved ones. Diagnoses. Car accidents. And believe me, I feel the weight. I have the same feeling sometimes. Why some of us and not others of us? And this could spur a big philosophical tangent. Many theologians have discussed this, and some have brought great responses, but at the end of the day, after all the philosophical conversations and and the responses that people have, we simply have to leave with God's ways are not our ways. And that's not just an easy out. I've had a lot of meetings with people. I think of a guy that came because his wife had really pushed him to come to church, and he came, didn't think he would like it, but then he he enjoyed it. He enjoyed the service, like the teaching and and the practicality of it, and he liked the community, but the God stuff really bothered him, and he stopped me after one service. I I need to talk to you. I got some questions. It was kind of like, you know, you need to answer my questions. 
So we sat down and talked a few days after this. And he, goes, and he says, you know, the classic question, why do bad things happen to good people? And I said, well, bad things happen to one good person and we killed him. Other than that, there really are no really good people. He says, okay, fine, then why do good things happen to some and not to others? And uh, that led to a longer conversation. But it, it all comes down to his ways are not mine. And if I could fit God into my puny little brain, he wouldn't be great. He wouldn't be God. Some things are for the Almighty to know and understand. And for me to simply say, God, I'm going to trust you in this. And others can conjecture further and try to come up with answers. But there's no way that I can explain these things fully. So I will let him be God. And I'll just be Scott. And I'll just go with his lead. Now, this is what we call resting in God. He's God, I'm not, and I can try to understand and search and come up with speculative answers, but when my head hits the pillow, I've just got to say, you're God, I'm not, and I'm going to trust you. You know everything and how it all fits together, I don't. We can actually see this play out in, in the next bit. Something very easy for us to miss in this next text. Look at verse 6. So verse 6, now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. Now if you highlight or underline in your Bible, I want to encourage you to highlight the sleeping. What is Peter doing? He's sleeping. Sleeping. I mean, how? He's chained between two soldiers, about to be executed. How does he sleep? You ever have a big interview the next day or some kind of a big meeting that you're all up on nerves about and you couldn't sleep? I mean, I think it's happened to most of us. But Peter, he's supposed to be tried, executed the next day, and he's asleep. Well, a couple of things. First, Peter doesn't seem to have a problem falling asleep when he's tired. Kind of like my wife. I mean, we'll head upstairs, and by the time I get my teeth brushed, she's already snoring. Or, oop, I, I, I better not say that, that she's breathing heavy. Is that better? <laughs> One time, Linda and I were praying together, and she fell asleep while we were praying together. And she was the one praying <laughs> mid-sentence. <laughs> and believe me, Linda's not slothful, though. She's a hard worker. She works hard, sleeps hard. And anyway, evidently, Peter's like that. Remember in the garden, he kept falling asleep when Jesus asked him to pray. And during the transfiguration, it says that he was sleepy. But I, th I think there's something else going on here. He's just not worried. Now, he was, before Jesus' resurrection, he was scared to death of the Romans. But now, after Jesus had conquered death, he saw him alive. After he saw him be crucified, he's not worried anymore about death. And besides that, he's been rescued from prison before. But another thing, remember what Jesus told him? Remember that breakfast that we had with Jesus a few weeks ago on the beach when he made the fire? And he said to Peter, when you are old. Jesus told him that he was going to get old. He wasn't old yet. He believed Jesus. So he's sleeping. But really, he's resting in the promise of God. Is that you? Do you live confidently because you know who God is? Do you know how great he is and that no matter what, he's good? Or do you live tied down by worry, trying to control tomorrow, even though you never can? Verse 7 says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. Which I think is actually kind of funny because it shows how well he was sleeping. I mean, the, 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 heaven from, he, the heavenly light is all over the cell, and, he, and the angel has to tap him to wake him up. Now, my wife checks her phone for the time in the middle of the night, and I'm up. Peter has the light from heaven all over the cell, and, and he's still sleeping. <laughs> Verse, uh, end of verse 7, then it says, And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Now, what happens now is really cool. I mean, so we're, we're here in first century Jerusalem, the city where all this is taking place. And you can see the Temple Mount that is towering over everything. Down here is the Pool of Siloam where Jesus healed a man and the... Uh, and many, what is Peter's, what the question is, but many think that it was over here, which was Herod's grandpa's massive palace that now Herod would have lived in. 
And Jesus would have actually been here the morning that he died. The problem is there's no prison cells in this palace. And so some speculate Herod used to throw people into the big empty water cisterns, using them as a jail. And maybe. But uh, I think it's more possible that Peter is... uh, And so this was actually that massive palace. But I think it's more possible that Peter was sitting over here. I mean, it seems to hold more water than the empty cistern. And the, the pun there is intended. So the question is, is Peter over here? The Roman soldiers, uh, uh, this was the headquarters for these Roman soldiers, and there would have been holding cells here. And also there's a public stage that Herod could sit and pronounce judgment on, in front of the crowds, which was Herod's plan after the Passover. Big public spectacle and helps his approval ratings. But as Herod sleeps, the chains have fallen off Peter, and Peter is following an angel into a prison break. Look at verse 9. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. I mean, he, I mean, he's so groggy, and he's still trying to figure out, am I awake or not? Verse 10, when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. So now this description fits the second location we looked at, the Roman garrison, because it's the point where you leave the jail and you could be outside the city walls, which is where Peter is, outside the city walls. So they sneak out and the door, in, uh, and, and, and then they are sneaking into the city and the door opens on its own. In verse 10, we read, uh, it opens for them a second time on their own accord. And they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him. So the, the streets are dark and he's probably groggy. I mean, wondering if he's dreaming all of this. In the building that towers over him, soldiers will be scurrying if they aren't already. I mean, they're frantic trying to find what happened to this prisoner of theirs. And he just kind of throws his cloak over his head and shuffles down a side road. Now, where's he going to go? So verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from... You know, at one point he wakes up and realizes, No, I am I'm free, I'm free. So verse 12, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Uh, many people, um, the, many, there's a lot of people that are at this home of Mary, who is Mark's mom. And this house has become a, kind of a, the, the Jewish headquarters for the church. We think that it may possibly also be the up, place of the upper room where, uh, where Jesus had the Passover meal with his disciples. And if that's the case, then Peter is heading over here. But the, it's interesting, in verse 12, Mark in verse 12, it says, this is Mary, the mother of Mark. We believe this is the Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark, that Peter actually had connected with him and had him write his account of all that happened in Jesus' early ministry and, and death uh, from Peter's perspective. That's the gospel of Mark. But now, this, now we have the comedy that kicks in. You consider the outrageous story that just happened. I mean, four Roman soldiers were assigned to Peter. Two of them were chained to him. Peter is able to get out of prison. And now Peter is unable to get into a prayer meeting for him. (laughs) Look at verse 13. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda. Rhoda just means Rose, so her name is Rose. A girl named Rose came to answer Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it it is his angel. Which, why would an angel wouldn't have to knock on the door? Angels just appear. So, uh, but Peter continued knocking, verse 16. And, you know, I I mean, I just see, he said, man, I can't even get in here. I can get out of prison. I can't get in here. He kept on knocking. And it says, then they saw him and were amazed. Now, I, I got to say, I, I admire this group. I'm not criticizing them. I mean, they're praying in the night. That's dedication. I admire that. But there's a lesson here. As we pray, we should be praying with hope. It doesn't mean we expect to, you know, to God give us whatever we're asking for. He's not a personal genie. But we should be praying, looking for God to do something here. I think too often we go to God, we've got this specified plan that we want him to do exactly what we want. You know, I, I want to work at this place. I want to be married by this age. I want a six foot four wealthy man. I want this many kids live here. And we come up to God with this plan and rather than going to him looking for his best and expecting that he's going to follow through on that. And um, that's this group. They're praying for something, but not expecting what God was about to do. My tendency is to pray with a detailed plan and then ask God to bless my plan. But God wants us to conform to his plan instead. So I've actually changed my strategy. I mean, early in my ministry, I had 10-year goals and 5-year goals and 1-year goals and monthly goals. And I'd have all this 
laid out. Even when I first came here, you know, I had all these goals I brought to the elders. We talk about it some, and, and I, I, God would always throw a monkey wrench in whatever my plans were. I've learned that there's a better way. It, it's not that we don't plan anymore, but now um, we're more about praying for God to give us opportunity and to tap us in the side when they, those opportunities come. We know that the Holy Spirit is always blowing, so we just need to hoist our sail and ask him to blow in whatever direction he sees fit. That works out a lot better. And that's how all of our bridge locations have come about. We didn't plan any of them. It was always somebody who came to me about those locations. It's what God was doing. So we're doing that now. We're, we're actually asking for an opportunity to, to relieve a Ranhurst Auditorium and attendance restrictions at that location for another opportunity, just looking for what God is going to do. The problem is when God has opportunity knocking at our door, and because we're not play, praying with hope and expectation, we don't, we're not looking for it, and we're not expecting it when it comes. And we could misidentify an opportunity as a distraction. Peter was more of a distraction to them, and that supposedly is what they were praying for. It's funny, but I think all of us have been there. Well, Peter tells them, and they let him in. He tells everybody what happened. In verse 18, there's a big uproar in the cell block. And soldiers are scrambling, trying to make sense of it all. Herod has the squad that was on the clock. He has them executed. And then Luke takes the story to another place, and something just as wild happens here that doesn't seem like it's related, but it is. If you look at the end of verse 19, Herod travels from Jerusalem to Caesarea Maritima. And we were actually in this place just a couple of weeks ago in Acts chapter 10. If you were in church that weekend, you remember we met a centurion named Cornelius that Peter had gone to. It's a beautiful coastal city. At the time, it was the Roman capital of Israel. And actually, when our church goes to Israel, this is the first stop that we take. There you see it today in its ruins. And we go there, we always head to the amphitheater. You can see the waves in the background, beautiful Mediterranean in the background. We walk over to the man-made peninsula, which was Pontius Pilate's home. Again, Herod the Great had also built that. Uh, we walk through the Hippodrome, where chariots race. Think of ancient NASCAR. And in this day, when Herod Agrippa travels, it would have looked like this. And when he came to town, Herod Agrippa stayed in Pilate's palace. Beach House, his grandfather built, close proximity to the whole entertainment district, Hippodrome and so forth. Now, Herod had planned to make a speech when he gets to this very Roman city and uh, very movers and shakers that live there because it's the capital of, of Israel. He's planning on making this speech. So if you look at verse 21, we read, On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took a seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. Interesting, the historian Josephus wrote about this very event that we have here in Acts 12. Um, he wrote that, that Herod wore this robe that was laced with silver threading. And in the sun, it was radiant as if it was self-illuminated. Actually, I saw a jacket like that at the mall. I almost bought it. Uh, I told Linda, I said, hey, I could be a televangelist. <laughs> Think about that. So what Herod does, he walks from the palace over to the, to the theater and... Um, Josephus says that as he walked into the theater, the eyes couldn't help but fixate on this resplendent figure. That detail of the clothing shines light then on verse 22. Look at verse 22. It says, And uh, the people were shouting, The voice of a God, and not of a man. Well, here it does look the part. He's glowing like the divine. His speech then gave people what they wanted, and they said, This is a God, not a man. Look at him. Look at verse 23, and immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Now, I used to think the eaten by words, that, that was just a kind of a poetic thing that, you know, they buried him and the worms wound up eating him. But no, actually, Josephus wrote that Herod's abdomen seemed to be the source of pain leading to what some have speculated was a burst of a cyst and with a lack of hygiene, roundworms were present. I know it's gross, but there's actual medical terminology for it. I, I just couldn't pronounce it. But it's quite a picture. It's gruesome and graphic. A whole arena of people. They're staring and they're chanting. And then he, he grabs his stomach. Majestic figure. Grabs his stomach. Doubles over. His entourage rushes in. The whole place falls silent. And you just hear the waves from the Mediterranean crashing against the rocks. The man who took the life of James and tried to take the life of Peter died in a humiliating yet ironic fashion. But look at verse 24. 
but the word of God increased and multiplied. Herod tried to stop it, but the gates of hell could not prevail, and the church grows. We have some application points that come out of this that are so clear. Number one, God sees. He sees everything. Nothing misses him. Nothing takes him by surprise. He sees it all. God saw James's arrest in Jerusalem, and he saw Herod give the orders of execution. He saw the precious life of James taken away. God sees. And he sees when your boss takes advantage of you. And he sees when that coworker or in-law mistreats you. He sees your tears when you drive home from the doctor. God sees. And I know there's some mixed emotions in that. I mean, there can be an element of comfort, knowing that the Almighty sees your pain. He sees the injustice. He sees the very thing that keeps you up at night. But there's also an element of frustration in that because he sees, but maybe he hasn't seemed to have done anything. Because this pain, this worry you carry, I mean, you've carried it for years. And that hurts. That's confusing. But it could very well be that your story is still at the beginning of Acts 12. And no, he hasn't acted yet. The question is, can you, or will you, continue on in faith? Can you take the next step, trusting him anyway? Because he's calling you to. Can you take it day by day in trust? Whether or not it's felt, the almighty God of the universe, he sees. But also, he hears. He does. And maybe it feels like your prayers don't make it past the ceiling. Maybe it feels like your prayers are just too big of an ask. But nothing is too big for the almighty. And if he took Peter past the guards, he can take you past whatever your predicament is. Just because you're still in it doesn't mean your prayer is ignored or unanswered. And sometimes we don't get an immediate yes in our prayers and we label that unanswered prayer. But no is sometimes the better answer because God loves you. And he knows the whole picture. And often the answer is not yet. But I guarantee it, he sees and he hears. And thirdly, God acts. I mean, who would have guessed the ending of Herod's life? I mean, 54 years old, the most powerful man in the region, politically connected, heavily armed. Nobody could have anticipated his end. And can we not forget that God acted in the greatest of ways on our behalf already? God saw our mess, our sin, how we were cut off from him. He heard our cries and he came and died in our place. The cross was his greatest act on your behalf. And he's not done with you. He's not done with your family. He's not done with what he's up to at your workplace. He's not done with whatever that situation is that you're up against. And he loves to do what nobody anticipates. Just ask the prayer group at Mary's house. He will act. Not in our timing, and maybe not in the way that you are thinking, but he will act, and when he does, it's far better than we can imagine if we faithfully trust and follow through the confusion and pain. This is uh, my friend Bob. We became friends as a senior in high school. We became best friends almost immediately, and then all through college, we were, we were together all the time. If somebody saw Bob without me, they'd ask where Scott was. If they saw me without Bob, they'd ask, they'd ask where Bob was. And, uh, and hung out all the time. And uh, Bob was quite the athlete. I mean, he was a basketball star in our school. He was All-State, a high scorer on our team, I think, for three years in a row. And play, also played in college. He's quite just an amazing athlete. Um, we kind of fell out of touch at, as we went our separate ways into ministry. He became a pastor, was a pastor of the same place for 37 years. And though periodically we'd call or see each other maybe every five years or so, I guess typical for guys. Um, but I found out about 10 years ago when I talked, I actually one of my phone calls with him that he told me he'd just been diagnosed with a neurological disease that was shutting off the communication between his brain and his legs and that he was eventually going to use the, lose the use of his legs. And this, this was a shock for me when you, somebody as healthy as he was, because even at 50, 
He was schooling 20-year-olds in basketball. And if anybody dared to challenge him in one-on-one, I mean, he just never lost. I, I don't think he ever lost. And in fact, you know Glenn Rivers. He beat Glenn Rivers in horse. Uh, if you, any of you are old enough to remember who he is, Doc Rivers. But um, actually, I think he's coaching the Bucks now, isn't he? Yeah. So, I mean, hard to, hard to understand that this guy would wind up in the condition that he found himself in. About a year ago, I called him just out of the blue and just asked him how he was doing. And he said, man, I, I'm not going to be able to continue pastoring anymore. I, I can't stand any longer to do sermons. And, and he said, I just can't fulfill my responsibilities. I get so tired. I, I, I don't feel like I want to retire, but I'm probably going to need to. And I, I just, my heart was so heavy when I hung up. And out of the blue, I just jumped on the church website. And I saw there that just four years before, he had gotten certified in biblical counseling. And we had just been praying that God would send us. We, we were looking to hire a pastor to oversee a biblical counseling ministry that would train other counselors and do a good chunk of counseling as well. So I called him back and found out that also Lynn was just starting a process of biblical counseling. And um, today, they're on our full-time staff uh, overseeing our counseling department. Lynn's tremendous difficulty with uh, debilitating depression has been this huge blessing in the way she's now able to minister to people like she never would have before. I mean, little did Lynn know as she cried out to God saying, why am I going through this? Little did she know that God had bigger plans that she could never have understood then. And of course, Bob asked to be healed of his neurological disease. But God also knows that in the condition that he's in, he'll be far more effective in helping others in the kingdom. Fact is, in this life, we will have trouble. We'll have injustice, sickness, evil seems to win. But God has plans we are often unaware of until he brings them about. And ultimately, this is not the end anyway. Because God acted on our behalf on the cross... The end for us is sweet. Our job isn't to control situations and look for God to work with our agenda. Our job is to be faithful in pain or in paradise. May we be faithful. He is the beginning and the end. And because of Jesus, the end will be sweet. So, where do you need to trust God? Where is it? What agenda have you been bringing to him? Is it in times of pain where you need to trust most? Actually, for a lot of us, it's harder to trust during success because we tend to forget about God then. Is it in your success? When there's confusion, is that where you need to trust God most? He's calling you to trust. I mean, connecting yourself to him, being connected to him, attaching to Jesus. It's all about faith, believing him, trusting him no matter what. Our Father, I I thank you that you've given to us this passage. We know that you see, that you hear, and you act trouble is not on your end. The trouble is on our end. We tend to lose faith. But Father, I pray in Jesus' name that right now as you're calling us to trust you no matter what. There's some hearts and lives and minds right now that you want to change. I pray that you would do that even right now. In fact, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want us just to give this time some quietness. And just for these next few moments, let's allow for the Holy Spirit to speak and you respond in whatever way. Maybe some commitment that you need to make, a recommitment to trust him. Maybe it's a a specific situation that you and he both know exactly what it is that you need to just say, God, I'm, I'm putting it in your hands and I trust you. Let him speak and respond. And Teddy's gonna sing over us.
stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, would you guys please stand and sing this? Even when I don't see it, you're working when I don't feel it, you're working. Come on, never stop, never stop working. Never stop, you never stop. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Come on, even when I don't feel You have to sing it for yourself. Come on, never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. We make a miracle work. Promise Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that's who he is. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. Who you are. Tell them. Man, I don't know about you, but that's a message that I needed to hear, that there is a God who sees, who hears, and he acts according to his purposes and his will. And knowing that he knows what's best for us, that brings me comfort. And I hope that this message brought you comfort as well. I do want to say, if you are a first-time guest, thank you so much for joining us on your way out. Make sure you stop by our welcome desk. We would love to give you a first-time guest gift. And then I would love to invite our prayer counselors up right now. These men and women, they would love to pray for you about anything. Maybe it's a question about the message. Maybe it's a question about faith. They're a great place to start. And then before you get out of here, would you turn to the person next to you and say hello? I hope you have a great day and God bless.